turn to the sixth book of the Old Testament, which is the book of Joshua. God made man on day six of creation. And the first book in your Bible named after a man is the book of Joshua, which just happens to be the sixth book of your Old Testament. That's no coincidence. Joshua 17. Joshua chapter 17. So kind of towards the end of the book. This is a great book about God giving victory. And I'll tell you more about that in a moment. But you're going to find a place here where there's not any victory. And we're going to talk about why that's the case. So go to Joshua 17. Uh, I will save some time and not read the entire chapter. But if you take a look at verse 1, get an idea of what's happening here. Uh, Joshua 17, 1. There was also a lot for the tribe of Manasseh, for he was the firstborn of Joseph. To wit, for Maker, the firstborn of Manasseh, the father of Gilead, because he was a man of war, therefore he had Gilead and Bashan. And then if you'll go on down there to verse uh, 7, you find out that there's a little bit more here about the lot or the land, the inherited land for the tribes of both Ephraim and Manasseh, which were the two sons of Joseph. That's a good thing to know if you don't know that. Joseph had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, and they both got an inheritance in the promised land. So go to verse 7. And the coast of Manasseh was from Asher to Michmetha, that lieth before Shechem. And the border went along on the right hand under the inhabitants of Entapua. Now Manasseh had the land of Tapua, but Tapua on the border of Manasseh belonged to the children of Ephraim. That's the other son of Joseph. Verse 9, and the coast descended unto the river Canaan. Southward of the river, these cities of Ephraim are among the cities of Manasseh. The coast of Manasseh also was on the north side of the river, and the outgoings of it were at the sea. Southward, it was Ephraim's, and northward, it was Manasseh's. And the sea is his border, and they met together in Asher on the north and in Issachar on the east. And Manasseh had in Issachar and in Asher Beth Shean and her towns, and Ibliam and her towns, and the inhabitants of Dor and her towns, and the inhabitants of Endor and her towns, and the inhabitants of Tanakh and her towns, and the inhabitants of Megiddo and her towns, even three countries. Yet the children of Manasseh could not drive out the inhabitants of those cities, but the Canaanites would dwell in that land. Now, you're probably thinking, you're going to preach on this? It's a bunch of names and cities and places. Just bear with me. But if you were a part of the tribe of Ephraim or Manasseh, you read that and you said, that land belongs to me. God gave it to me. Or you should have said that. You'll see what happens here as we go on. Look at verse 13. Yet it came to pass when the children of Israel were waxen strong that they put the Canaanites to tribute, but did not utterly drive them out. Now, this is where we're going to take our message from the last five verses here, 14 through 18. So take a look at what happens here and how these sons of Joseph respond. And the children of Joseph spake unto Joshua, saying, Why hast thou given me but one lot and one portion to inherit, seeing I am a great people? For as much as the Lord hath blessed me hitherto. And Joshua answered them, If thou be a great people, then get thee up to the wood country, and cut down for thyself there in the land of the Perizzites and of the giants, if Mount Ephraim be too narrow for thee. Look at the response of them in verse 16. And the children of Joseph said, The hill is not enough for us. And all the Canaanites that dwell in the land of the valley have chariots of iron. But they who are of Bethshean and her towns, and they who are of the valley of Jezreel. So then Joshua responds, verse 17. And Joshua spake unto the house of Joseph, even to Ephraim, and to Manasseh, saying, Thou art a great people, and hast great power. Thou shalt not have one lot only, but the mountain shall be thine, for it is a wood, and thou shalt cut it down, and the outgoings of it shall be thine. For thou shalt drive out the Canaanites, though they have iron chariots, and though they be strong. All right, now this is an Old Testament passage, and you, you, a lot of times you read the Old Testament, you think, ah, that doesn't have anything to do with us. But I want to point out this morning with the Lord's help, the attitude of these sons of Joseph when it came to what they were given by God and their failure to do what they were supposed to do and why they failed. And I think that you'll see that the attitudes that they had, and I'm going to cover a couple of them this morning, are a whole lot like people you live around and maybe even be like, you may be like, today in the year 2021. I got a date in my Bible. 
1444 BC. That's 3,400 years ago. And the attitudes of the people that we read about, those sons of Joseph, 3,400 years ago are prevalent today around us. And I hope it's not us, but it sure could be us. So let's stay away from that. I say that because your Bible's relevant. People like to say, oh, the Bible doesn't apply to us anymore. And the Old Testament surely doesn't apply to us anymore. The attitudes of these people, you're gonna, say, you're gonna hopefully see this morning, are all around us, and we gotta watch out that they're not a part of us. So let's uh, ask the Lord to help us with this this morning and understand. Lord, thank you for the reading of the scriptures, the fact that we have the very words you want us to have this morning. And it is going to be impossible for me to explain things unless you do the work this morning of uh, just putting the light on the scriptures. And I'm asking you to do that this morning. I don't want to get in the way here, Lord. We want you to do your work. We want to have understanding of the passage that we read. We want to have understanding of all the verses that we look at this morning. And I pray that most of all, the name of Jesus Christ be lifted up and that you would receive the glory and you would get, get spiritual work done today in the hearts of all of us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So when you read your Bible, uh, well, you want to find out where you are in history. So I've already given you that about 1400 BC, a long time ago. And then you also want to ask the context of the passage. What is the context of the passage? I already kind of gave that to you. It's the inheritance of the tribes of Israel in the land of Canaan, also known as, help me out, the promised land. Okay. So if you didn't know that, in your Old Testament, God promised these Israelites, I'm giving you some land. But when you get in that land, you're going to have to fight in order to conquer the land. But the Lord promised them, I'll be with you. So let me show you that. Go to Joshua 13, just back a few pages. I'll make you do a little work this morning, which will hopefully help you pay attention. I know whenever you turn in your Bible, you have a tendency to kind of stick with what's being said. So go to Joshua 13, just a few, year, uh, a few pages back. Verse 1, and you'll get an idea of what the Lord told these people to do once they got into the promised land. Verse 1, now Joshua was old and stricken in years, and the Lord said unto him, Thou art old and stricken in years, and there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed. This is the land that yet remaineth, all the borders of the Philistines and all Geshuri from Sihor, which is before Egypt, even under the borders of Ekron northward, which is counted to the Canaanite, five lords of the Philistines, the, Ge the Gazathites and the Ashtathites, the Eshkelonites, the Gittites, and the Ekronites, also the Avites from the south, all the land of the Canaanites, and Mira, that is beside the Zidonians, unto Aphek, to the borders of the Amorites, and the land of the Giblites, and all Lebanon, toward the sun rising from Baalgad, under Mount Hermon, under the entering into Hamath. Now watch verse 6. All the inhabitants of the hill country, from Lebanon, unto Mis. Rephothmaim and all the Zidonians, them will I do what? What's it say? That's the Lord talking. Them will I drive out from before the children of Israel, only divide thou it by lot unto the Israelites for an inheritance as I have commanded thee. So all the Israelites had to do once they were told what land belonged to them, all they had to do is go in there and say, we're going to fight and we're going to take it. And they had the Lord God Almighty on their side. So if they went in there and fought with the Lord's help, what would happen, folks? They would win. Problem. These people, these sons of Joseph, did not want to do that. So before I really dive into this, uh, just a couple of reminders here that will hopefully make this personal for all of us. The Christian life is to be a life of action. If you notice, these sons of Joseph didn't want to do anything. And we'll cover a little bit about their laziness here in a moment. If you're saved, you are called to do work for Jesus Christ. Now, you didn't do work to get saved, but you should be doing something for the Lord because you're saved. So the, the passage here, Ephesians 2, you don't have to turn there, but it says, verse 10, for we are his, talking about God's, workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto, you know the verse, good works. We don't get, do good works to get saved. We do good works because we're saved. We do it so that God can be glorified. So if you're saved, you are called to action. You're not called to sit around and do nothing. And that's popular in the world today, isn't it? In fact, we're being conditioned in our world today by our own government. Hey, just sit back and do nothing and you'll get paid to do it. Uh, I've been amazed that the, I was up at the camp a few weeks ago. Some of you know I was up in Massachusetts. 
and we were severely short-staffed, 300 plus kids, and about half the staff that we normally had with uh, more kids than that, but still half the staff. And the directors of the camp said, we can't get anybody to work. People are getting paid to stay at home. We can't get people to work. Sad state we're in, isn't it? You know Christianity? You got a lot of people come to church, sit in the pews, shake their head and say, amen, amen. Don't do anything for the Lord all week. Don't spend any time in their Bible. Don't spend any time talking to the Lord. And folks, the fifth book of the New Testament is called the book of Acts. Short for Acts of the Apostles. And that book records a lot of the things the apostles said. But you know what it focuses on? All the things the apostles did. If you're saved, you're called to do something for God. So uh, we're going to take a look at why these people didn't do something that they were supposed to do. And I tell you, it, it, this thing hits me square in the eyes. Now, uh, in your Old Testament, Joshua is a book of conquering. I think there's a New Testament book that lines up with the book of Joshua. I think it's the book of Ephesians. Turn over there real quick. I'll show you a couple verses in the book of Ephesians that I think apply to what we're seeing over there in Joshua. So Ephesians. Ephesians is the book that tells you how to go to war and win spiritually. I said spiritually. Uh, Ephesians 6. Go to Ephesians 1. But Ephesians 6 talks about how we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's not against each other in the church or even against your neighbors that are unsaved. You're, you're actually fighting against principalities, powers. It's spiritual wickedness that is present in this world. And uh, you do that with the armor of God, spiritual armor. But real quick, go to Ephesians 1 verse 3. Before I read this, I want to tell you that God has given you, if you're saved, he's given you promises and they are spiritual promises. But you will never know about those promises if you don't read the Bible and find out, hey, I have some things that God gave me. And then when you know that, you're moved to action because of those things. So look at verse 3, Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed who? Okay, if you're saved, that's you. Blessed us with all, what kind of blessings? Spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now, let me clarify something. In the Old Testament... The Israelites had a physical inheritance and they were promised physical blessings. Did you know that you and I, saved people in the church age, we're actually not given any promises of physical blessing. Did you know that? But you are loaded up with spiritual blessings. So let's take a look at what you got real quick. Go to verse 15. Same chapter, verse 15. What do you have spiritually if you're saved? Well, let's look, take a look here. Verse 15. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus... And love to all the, unto all the saints. Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Now watch verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Now, a few things there I see. You got some spiritual blessings listed there. You know what you got? Look at verse 17. You know, if you're saved, what you have, you have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Did you know that? You know what that means? If you're saved, you can open your Bible and understand what the Bible says and the Holy Spirit will show you what the Bible says. And I know God uses teachers and preachers. I get that. But did you know you can open your Bible at home away from church and ask God to show you something that maybe the preacher didn't say? And what a thing. God gave you the ability to understand the scriptures. That to me is a huge spiritual blessing. Did you notice it says there, Verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Have you had your eyes enlightened over the last, oh, year and about four or five months? Now, a lot of Christians have become fearful over the last year and five months. I'm going to hit on that here in a minute. There's no reason for you to be fearful. 
looking at what happened, I remember we were sitting at my, my wife's uh, uh, sister's house back in March of 2020. And we're talking about this whole thing. I think the TV might have been on and we're seeing the NBA shut down and this corporation shut down. And, this and I said, man, something's going on here. Something weird is happening here. And then I began to think about it. And as the days passed and the weeks went on there, March and April, May last year, I said to myself, this world is just getting itself ready for the tribulation. And the devil is doing a job on the world, getting their hearts and minds ready for a great deception. Now, I saw that. And you, many, you saw this too. I've talked to many of you and hear about this very thing. You saw it. How did you see that? How did you go, instead of getting all scared like so many people, how did you say, this is pretty awesome time we're living in? How did you do that? You know your Bible gives you spiritual blessings in Jesus Christ. And no matter what happens to this crazy world, you don't have to worry about it. Now, you might have to endure some hard things. I get it. We might have a shortage, talking here to Don here, might have a shortage of food and who knows what else here soon. Maybe power. Oh, no. Hey, God said in Philippians 4, my God shall supply all your need your need, not everything we want, but our need according to his riches and glory by Jesus Christ. So is God going to take care of you? Okay. You got anything to scare, be scared about then? Not really. We'll talk about how those sons of Joseph were scared here in a minute. Go to Ephesians 3. Book of victory in the New Testament. How to have victory. Ephesians. Look at chapter 3. Oh, man, I tell you, you got, you got quite something in your hands spiritually if you got a Bible and you're saved. Well, you've got all kinds of uh, insight into this world we live in. 314. For this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the what? Who's the richest in the universe? Bill Gates, right? Oh, no, I think he's been taking Elon Musk. Oh, no, no, Bezos. No, he spent all his money going to space, didn't he? Hey, who's the richest that there is in the universe? If you're saved, he's your father. It's the Lord God Almighty. Look what it says there. According to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. You know, it doesn't matter how weak you may be physically. If you're saved, God has given you great spiritual strength inwardly so you can see all the things going on around you and not flip out and trust God to get you through. Look at verse 18 or 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, watch verse 18, it's loaded, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Watch verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh where in us unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages world without end. Amen. I love that verse 18 there. It says comprehend, be able to comprehend the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ. Hey, if you know the love of Jesus Christ towards you, you got the greatest blessing anybody who's ever lived could ever have right? You got something, you live in, uh, I know we're not talking dispensations this morning, but you live in the greatest time of all, the church age. And we're talking about this with James and Jules yesterday. You, you and I might be the generation of people that never sees death. Everybody in the church age doesn't have that opportunity because you got people I put quotes by John R. Rice in the bulletin this morning. He died in 1980. He wanted to see, he wanted to be alive at the rapture. He, he passed away. I might pass away and you might pass away before the rapture too, but I'm alive right now and so are you. At least you look like you are. That means you got a chance because the rapture could happen when? You, you, you got a chance right now. You're breathing. You got a chance. Amen. That could change tomorrow. I get it. It could change for any of us, but... We're living in the greatest time period where the spiritual blessings are abundant if you know the Lord Jesus Christ. I say that, stop whining about what you don't have if you're saved. 
Don't you have everything you need if you're saved? Don't need anything else. I know we think, oh, I got to have this. got to have it. Stop it. You have everything you need. You may not have everything you want, but we know what wants do. You know what wants lead to? A covetous heart. Isn't that right? Get your heart out of the world and get your heart into the word of God. You'll see you've got everything you need. All right. I didn't mean to go on all that, but let's go back to Joshua there. And let's take a look here at what happened with these people, the sons of Joseph. And uh, why they could not be satisfied. Here's the title of the message, by the way. Saved, but not satisfied. And I know that these, these uh, sons of Joseph are Israelites and they lived at a different time we do. But they are a great picture of people today who are saved. Yet they sit around and are unsatisfied with their lives. So let's dive in here. Look at verse 14. And uh, I'll, I'll give you the first point after we read. And what was wrong with these sons of Joseph? And the children of Joseph spake unto Joshua, saying, Why hast thou given me but one lot and one portion to inherit, seeing, watch it, I am a great people, for as much as the Lord hath blessed me hitherto. When I read that verse, I see entitlement. First point this morning, entitlement. Joshua, you didn't give us enough. Joshua, we deserve more. Joshua, we're great. You see that? Entitlement. Notice how they refused to get up and go take the land that God had given them. Instead, I see some self-pity when I read verse 14. And particularly that statement there, and I want to talk about it here for a few moments. That statement, verse 14, where they say, seeing I am a great people. So on this point of entitlement, let's talk about what makes a person great, or you could say even a nation great, biblically. Let's go look at a few verses here. Go back to Genesis 26. What makes a person great in the sight of God? I think that'd be a good thing. Go back there to Genesis 26. Uh, take a look at what God says about greatness, what your Bible says about being great. Look at 26.12, Genesis 26.12. Then Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year an hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. Now, notice in verse 12, who blessed him? The Lord blessed him. Look at verse 13. And the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became what? Very great. For he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and great store of servants and the Philistines envied him. Folks, the greatness of Isaac was because the Lord blessed him. Anybody who is great in the sight of the Lord is because of the Lord. If, if you're here uh, a few weeks ago, I was not present here. Uh, got, to, got to see uh, some of the uh, video of this. You heard from Frank and James and Jules about the greatness of God in their lives. Didn't you hear that? Some of you here saw that, heard that? That was a great thing because you saw them give God the glory for everything that's happened to them. And that's the way it should be. If you are a great person, you are only great because God has given you the greatness. He's blessed you. And you should, by the way, if that's the case, don't go around saying, I'm great. Let the Lord show people what you are and who you are. And remember, it's because of the Lord if you are great and nobody else. The world speaks of self-made men and women. If you're saved and you're great, you are a God-made great man or woman. Nothing about you. So stop thinking about you. Notice the people of Joseph thought a lot of themselves. Go to Exodus 11. How about another fellow that was great in the sight of God? Let's look at why. Exodus chapter 11. You got to look at a whole bunch of these things on greatness. There's a whole message here on greatness. I'm just going to show you a couple things here. Look at uh, Exodus 11, verse 3. Exodus 11, verse 3. And the Lord gave people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man, Moses, was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people. Now, if you study the life of Moses, 
When the Lord first showed up and spoke to Moses and told him he was going to deliver the Israelites, what did Moses say? There's no way I can do it. And God had to show him, God had to show him Moses, I am going to use you, and I'm going to use you to accomplish my work, and you just trust me that I'll do it. And Moses had the right attitude. He knew nothing. He thought nothing of himself. He thought everything of the Lord. In fact, your Bible says he's the meekest man on the earth when he was alive. He trusted completely in the Lord. And would you say Moses was a great man? We're talking about him a long time after he lived. And people all around the world know about Moses. People that know nothing about the Bible know about Moses. And I'd say he was a great man because God made him great. Right? Go to Psalm 145. Here's a verse on the greatness of God. Just lays it out real clear. Go to Psalm 145. Now again, when you realize that your greatness comes from God, and everything you have comes from God, you will not have this attitude of entitlement thinking that you deserve anything. Uh, on that note, I'll tell you what I deserve, and I'll tell you what you deserve. It may not sound nice, but I'm right here with you. You know what we deserve? Uh, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is what? You know what we all deserve? Hell. Now, are you saved? Why are you saved? Jesus Christ paid the price for you. And it had, your salvation has zero to do with you. You did not deliver yourself from God's wrath. Jesus Christ suffered God's wrath on your behalf. And if you trusted him and called on him to save you, amen. you deserve hell, but amen, you're not going there if you're saved, right? So you want to talk about entitlement? You know what we all deserve? That's what we deserve. We are entitled to the wrath of God for all eternity. But Jesus Christ made it possible for us to escape that. Amen? Should be about him since he's the one that did the work. All right, Psalm 145. Take a look at verse 3. Psalm 145, verse 3. Great is who? The Lord. And greatly to be praised. And his greatness is what? Unsearchable. That is a great verse there. Great verse. Notice the word great three times in that verse. Great, greatly, and greatness. All about who? The Lord. Now go to the New Testament. How about one more in the New Testament? Now I will tell you, uh, Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9 in your New Testament. And I will tell you that it, it's actually not a bad thing. And I'll show you biblically. It's not a bad thing for you to have the desire to be great. You'll see that here. But let's make sure that you get the Bible formula for greatness. And it's got nothing to do with you making yourself great. It's got to do with God making you great. So go look at Mark chapter 9. Look at verse 33. Mark 9. Go down there to verse 33, the Lord talking here, you'll see. And he came to Capernaum and being in the house, he asked him, the Lord, this is the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, what was it that ye disputed among yourselves by the way? And he's talking to the disciples. Look at verse 34. But they held their peace. They didn't want to tell him what they were talking about. Here's why. For by the way, they had disputed among themselves who should be the, can you imagine that conversation? I, you figure Peter was probably in there. I'm better than all y'all. And then, and then James and John, you know, the three inner circle guys, they, they, they probably had it out, those three. And they all probably made a case of why they're their greatest. Look what the Lord says to them. He actually, the Lord does not, uh, every time I read this, I'm, I'm amazed. The Lord did not rebuke them for their desire to be great. Instead, he told them the formula for greatness in his eyes. Now, before I read verse 35, this is not the world's formula for greatness. The world's formula for greatness is a whole lot different than this, completely opposite. But look at 35. He's going to tell you in the next couple of verses, the Bible formula for greatness. Verse 35, and he sat down and called the 12 and saith unto them, if any man desire to be first, the same shall be what? Last of all and servant of all. You want to be great in the sight of God? Become a servant. Hello, Philippians 2, 5, Jesus Christ took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And because he humbled himself, humbled himself, God exalted him. So you want to be great in the sight of God? 
think nothing of yourself and everything of God. And let God raise you up. That's the Bible formula for greatness. Now go back to Joshua 17. Let's get something else on this entitlement thing. Uh, entitlement. Oh, I, I should have more. I need more. We deserve more. We're, we're so great. Well, if you're great, it's because God's made you great. So let's take a look here. Look at what Joshua tells these folks in verse 15. He responds to them. So this is his response to their claims of we deserve more. Look at uh, verse 15, Joshua 17. And Joshua answered them, if thou be a great people, then get thee up to the wood country and cut down for thyself there in the land of the Perizzites and of the giants, if Mount Ephraim be too narrow for thee. You know what Joshua said? He said, oh, you want more? Go do the work. Take it. It's going to take some effort. You're going to have to get off your lazy rear end and go, but go get it. Did you notice there? He says, get thee up to the wood country, cut down for thyself. He says, you want it? Go take it. And we live in a world where so many people think they deserve something for nothing. God did not make you to sit around and do nothing. Today, we have people who believe they are great. Yet when they are challenged to do something difficult, they refuse. Uh, it is not an easy thing to witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Would everybody agree with me on that? It can sometimes be daunting and fearful and difficult. Uh, what are we supposed to do for the Lord Jesus Christ? Speak up for the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, if you do so, you know what you've got? You've got great reward in doing that. But if you sit around and don't ever say anything, don't ever do anything, you're going to miss out on that. These people were told by Joshua, you want more? Go get more. Go to work. And they, you're going to see here in a minute their response. They just wanted to sit around and do nothing. Uh, reminder here. This is a good verse for our world that we live in today. 2 Thessalonians 3.10. If any would not work, neither should he eat. You know what we got in our world today? We got a lot of people that are being fed and they haven't worked for their food. Guess who's giving it to them? The good old USA. Isn't that something? And what's ha you're seeing this happen in our world today. We're being conditioned to take all these things that we haven't earned and just take it, so-called, for free, and sit back and don't worry about anything. And trust your government rather than trusting God. Folks, uh, get your eyes off the government. Get your eyes on the Lord. Are you noticing this? Our own government is trying to get us to the place where you just... Sit back and relax. We got this. And, and I, I, I'm glad I'm an American. I'm sure you are too. I wouldn't want to be in any other country in the world. But any blessings I have, whether physical or spiritual, come from God. And let's make sure we don't trust in what all these people are telling us, but trust your Bible, trust in the Lord, okay? A couple old friends bumped into one another on the street one day. And uh, one of the fellas looked very discouraged. And uh, almost on the verge of tears. So the friend, who he hadn't seen in a while, asked him, he says, Hey man, uh, what's going on with you, old friend? What, why are you so down and discouraged? So the sad fellow said, Well, let me tell you. Three weeks ago, an uncle of mine died and left me $40,000. So his friend said, Man, that's a lot of money. I'm sorry that your uncle died, man, but that's a lot of money he left you. Well, then the fellow says, well, then two weeks ago, a cousin I never even knew passed away and left me $85,000 free and clear. And the other friend says, man, I, sure sounds like uh, with the loss of these family members, you've had some blessing come your way. And then the fellow says, uh, you don't understand. Last week, my great aunt passed away and I inherited almost a quarter of a million dollars. And his friend said, um, okay, it's time out. Why are you so down and defeated? Why are you so discouraged? And the fellow said, well, this week, nothing. I got nothing. The guy, and here's our world, folks. The guy had gotten used to something for nothing. And you get conditioned to the place where you say, I deserve this. I deserve that. No, you don't. If you got those blessings coming your way, they're because of the Lord. When you come to expect something for nothing, you know what goes along with that? 
Expecting something for nothing goes hand in hand with you stopping from counting your blessings. When you stop counting your blessings, you become entitled. So uh, this entitlement, I deserve this, I deserve that. Oh, no, you don't. Be thankful for what you have. And in the meantime, get busy doing something for the Lord Jesus Christ. Joshua told them in verse 15, they could have more if they were willing to put forth a little extra effort. He said, hey, you can have more. You're just going to have to work for it. Now, let me give you a little, uh, a little application here. Would you like to know more about the Lord? Would you like to know more of his word? I hope that's you. You know what you're going to have to do? You have to carve out some time. Five minutes isn't going to cut it. Sorry, folks. 15 minutes isn't going to cut it. You're going to have to carve out some time, 30 minutes, hour, hour and a half, and get in a quiet place and read and study the scriptures. You want motivation? You want inspiration? You want discernment? You and God, one-on-one -on -one with your Bible open. Folks, uh, we live in a world where, oh, I'll just read my little daily devotional, which takes three minutes. Come on. And that's it. That's all you got for the whole day. That's not going to sustain you, folks. Get in the Word of God and do some work. We're told to study the Bible, right? We're commanded to. Much study, this is over in Ecclesiastes, much study is a weariness of the flesh. Any of you fellows in here and, and, and the ladies who've taught Sunday school before, any, any of you have done that? If you want to give a good lesson, you want to give a good sermon, what's it going to take on your behalf? You're going to have to do some work. Stop depending on the preacher or the Sunday school teacher to give you something from God's word. God gave you a Bible. You get busy and get in there yourself. You know what else is some work? It takes labor to pray, doesn't it? Carve out some time. Get alone with God. Maybe even take the time to get down on your knees and pray. That's a labor, but it's worthwhile. Amen. Amen. Folks, stop making all these excuses, and I'm going to get excuses here in a minute, thinking that you're entitled to something, and how about we get busy doing something for the Lord? Those are two easy things. I'll give you a third. There's actually a little side note here. There's three talks, three talks you ought to have every day. Number one, the Lord ought to talk to you. You ought to hear from him. That's your Bible study, Bible reading. Number two, you ought to talk to God. That's your prayer life, right? Number three, you ought to talk to other people about the Lord. Three talks every day ought to be a part of our lives. Now, you know what's going to have to happen for us to have all three of those? You're going to have to take some time and do a little work in order to do that, right? These people said, we don't need to do the work. We should have all this stuff. And that's just contrary to what your scriptures say. Now, let's look at the response here. Verse 16. Let's see if these people are going to get busy. You probably already figured out they're not going to. Verse 16. The children of Joseph said, the hill is not enough for us. And all the Canaanites that dwell in the land of the valley, uh-oh, they have chariots of iron. Oh, no. Both they who are of Bethshean and her towns and they who are of the valley of Jezreel. So we had entitlement, point number one. Point number two this morning, excuse making. You see the excuses there? It's not enough for us, Joshua. Give us more. And then they say, those Canaanites, Joshua, they have iron chariots. Don't you know about the iron chariots? We are nothing against the iron chariots. We can't beat them. So here's the attitude of, I need more, but I'm not willing to do anything about it. Did you notice also in that verse, verse 16, there's some fear that comes out there. And the fear is the Canaanites have chariots of iron and then the people in Bethshean and Jezreel, they do too. Joshua, all these people, they're strong. What are we going to do, Joshua? Now, if you've read Joshua, you know that Joshua needed some encouragement from the Lord. Let's look at that real quick. And this same encouragement that he got, he gave to them. Go to Joshua 1 real quick. Uh, when I read Joshua, I, I think that Joshua was a guy who maybe was uh, hesitant to go out and do this great thing of leading these people. And the reason I say that is because the Lord had to tell him over and over the same thing. And finally he got it. Don't you need to hear the same thing uh, more than once oftentimes before you get it? I don't know how you are, but that's how I am. Look at verse uh, 6, Joshua 1, 6. 
This is what the Lord told Joshua. Look at verse 6, Joshua 1, 6. Be, what's that next word? Strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Look at verse 7. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Look at verse 9. Verse 9. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Look at this. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. How come? Look at the end of the verse. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Now, if you're saved, who's living inside you? Holy Spirit of God. Lord Jesus Christ. Does he go everywhere you go? Hello, does he? Yes. What do you got to be afraid of? What are you afraid of? If you're saved, what are you afraid? Who are you afraid of? How about that one? <gasps> you don't know what CNN said this week. Who cares what CNN said this week? Probably not telling you the truth. And I could go any news station. You know how this goes. Folks, are you realizing the misinformation present in our world is designed, I said designed, to keep you fearful. Live in fear. The Lord does not want you to live in fear. Now, I, I, let me, let me, a uh, word of caution. The Lord doesn't want you to be foolish either. So are there some things you should be doing in the world, crazy world we live in today, maybe to take some precautions? Absolutely. At the same time, with precautions taken, you got to trust the Lord. Because even with precautions taken, things can happen to you that maybe you didn't anticipate happening. Uh, I'll, I'll just give you my personal testimony with this whole coronavirus thing. Uh, I got the virus. And, and I, I was actually, when early on in this thing, I was not fearful. And then the more we went along, I was like, I don't want to get the virus. Okay. Pastor and Miss Linda, well, Pastor officially didn't get it, but he probably did. They both got it. And we got some other people in here. Now, I'm going to say something. Make sure you get this. Praise be to the Lord and only the Lord that I'm still standing up here today. Okay? And by the way, before I got the virus, I was taking vitamin C. And, and actually, I increased my zinc after I got it, thanks to Miss Diana telling me to do that. <laughs> and I was doing all that. I was taking precautions and I still got sick and thank the Lord. I got through it. Amen. And if you hear and you had the, got the, got sick, you got through. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Uh, Tom's another one had it, man. Thank the Lord you're here. Okay. What I'm saying is this, you can take precautions, but you still got to trust the Lord, right? If you're really trusting the Lord for all these little things, you will not be fearful. God, you know this? I'll show you a Bible on this. 2 Timothy 1.7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. So if you're fearful, you may be listening to the world a little too much. It says he's given us a spirit of power and love and a, you ready for this one? We all need this one. A sound mind. You know how you get a sound mind? You read the sound words found in the scriptures and you build on sound doctrine contained in the scriptures. That's how you have a sound mind in a crazy mixed up world. Amen. There's no need to be fearful. Now notice something about excuses here. I notice actually three things. I'll, I'll give you the three and we won't have time to really talk about them. But I'll give you three things that I see in this response. Uh, go back there to Joshua 17. Joshua 17 again. And uh, we'll kind of get to try to get to the end here as quick as we can. Joshua 17, I see that they complain in verse 16. The hill's not enough for us. I see that they make excuses about the Canaanites having those char chariots of iron. And I also see fear. But let's just talk for a moment here about making excuses. Uh, he that is good at making excuses is seldom good for anything else. That's not Bible, but I think that's a good quote. I'll give you another thing that's not Bible, but my seventh grade math teacher, you talk about an influence. She said, some really sharp lady, uh, very, uh, I, for me to be talking about her, and this was 30 plus years ago, 
She left an impression. I'm going to tell you one of the things that she said to me every, so not just to me, but to the class every day, multiple times. You ready for this? Excuses are tools to nothingness. Public school in the 80s in Dallas, Texas. Excuses are tools to nothingness. Public school, 2021, teacher probably get fired for saying that. <laughs> Folks, if you make excuses about what you can't do, you're going to focus on you instead of the Lord. Stop making excuses about what you can't do. Trust the Lord to get done whatever you can get done. Stop making excuses. And notice that these excuses that they make are driven by fear. Uh, real quick, uh, I won't, we won't go over there, but it's kind of funny. Funny verse in your Bible, Proverbs 22. It says, the slothful man saith, there's a lion in the streets. Folks, have you ever seen a lion in your street? Even back there in Bible times, they had these towns and these cities. And it was probably very unlikely for a lion to be strolling through town. That guy over in Proverbs 22 is making excuses about why he didn't want to get up and do something. Don't be like that. Don't be slothful. Watch what comes out of your mouth when you're asked to do something for the Lord. If the first thing that comes out of your mouth is, well, I'm busy. Are you really? <laughs> we got a young man here who just answered for us. Exactly. Most of the time. Now, I know there's, uh, hey, uh, we are, we're all, come on, we're all busy to some degree, to some degree. But if you're too busy to get something done for the Lord, you got too much going on. Or maybe you're stretching the truth a little bit. Don't be an excuse maker. What's your excuse for not doing what God wants you to do? People give all kinds of excuses for not coming to church. You ever heard some of these? I'll just give you a couple here. Here's 2021 excuses for not coming to church. It's an Olympic year. The Olympics are on TV. It's only once every four years. I can't miss the Olympics. It's so early. I got to get my sleep, right? 10 o'clock is not early, by the way. Come on. Some of you older folks, you know, that's, you should have been up by about, for about five or six hours if, if it's 10 o'clock, right? Right? Uh, my generation's not like that. We, my generation sh sh gets up whenever, uh, uh, shows up to work and gets up whenever they feel like it, which is uh, 10, 11 o'clock sometimes, right? Uh, how about this one? I don't need to be there in person if I can watch it online. Something different about being in person. I know there's people that can't be here in person. I get that. But a lot of times that's an excuse. Uh, how about this one? I'm not going to church because all those people at the church house are hypocrites. I don't want to be around a bunch of hypocrites. Yep, I'm a hip I'll, I'll, I'll join that club. The focus is, should not be on the people at the church. It ought to be on the Lord, right? If you really want to get something done for the Lord, drop the excuses and get busy doing it. Making excuses will keep you from being what the Lord made you to be. So there's a whole lot we can unpack there, but I just want to get to this last thing here now. Uh, after the excuse making and the pleas of entitlement, uh, you, you might think that Joshua would just come out and give a harsh rebuke to these people, but he actually doesn't do that. And I think in the year 2021 with and, and me being in education and seeing how this goes, a lot of times, rather than giving a rebuke, the, the strategy that Joshua uses here might be a good one to use. Look what he says here in verse 17. He doesn't rebuke them. Look what he says instead. Verse 17. And Joshua spake unto the house of Joseph, even to Ephraim and to Manasseh, saying, Thou art a great people. And hast great power. Thou shalt not have one lot only, but the mountain shall be thine, for it is a wood, and thou shalt cut it down. And the outgoings of it shall be thine, for thou shalt drive out the Canaanites, though they have iron chariots, and though they be strong. You know what Joshua did? He didn't rebuke them. You know what he did instead? Last point. He gave them a little encouragement. So these entitled people who are making excuses, you know what they got from Joshua? Encouragement to go and do something in the Lord's power. So uh, real quick here, I, I won't take the time to go look at the passages. I'll give them to you though. I, I mentioned these are sons, or your Bible said these are sons of Joseph. Do you remember who Joseph was in your Bible? Okay, we're in the Old Testament, so not the, the, the stepfather of Jesus, not, not him. Old Testament, Joseph, one of the 12 sons of Jacob. Joseph, the son that was sold into slavery by his own brothers. 
Joseph, the guy who, who could have become very bitter and hateful, but he didn't. And the Lord took that guy, Joseph, and because of his humility, the Lord took that guy from way down here all the way up to second in command in Egypt. You read Genesis 41, you'll find out that he was a great man. You know why he was a great man? Because God made him great. Because he just put all his circumstances in the Lord's hand. And said, this, he, he, you'll never see Joseph saying, Lord, it's not fair. You'll never see Joseph making an excuse. He was a great man because God made him great. Notice these sons of Joseph. They're great. Joshua tells them they're great. But what does he remind them? Hey, you're great because God made you great. And he'll give you the power to drive out those people to land. Folks, God has given you the power. You just got to trust him. To get something done for him in these last days we live in. Right before the rapture. Hopefully it's soon, right? Uh, you go over there to... Oh, by the way. You go to... Uh, take the time to study this out. Don't take my word for it. If you go to Numbers 13. Guess which tribe of Israel good old Joshua's from. You want to guess? The tribe of Ephraim. One of the two sons of Joseph. Isn't that something how these sons of Joseph... I kind of think maybe they didn't know their history. They forgot about their great, 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 great grandfather, Joseph, and what he did. You know what we need to do, us Bible believers sometimes need to do? We need to be reminded of our history. Have you ever studied a little Baptist history? You ought to do so. Uh, study the Baptist history in America. You know what you find out if you do that? You'll find out there were Baptists that had to fight against the baby sprinklers here in our own country in the early days of America. And they said, we're not going to tolerate that false doctrine. Uh, we're going to go by the Bible. And there's a guy, I'll tell you, you got to read about this week. Read about old Obadiah Holmes. You write that name down, search him out. Obadiah Holmes, a guy that very few Baptists know about, that said, I'm not doing this Catholic baby sprinkling nonsense. I'm a Baptist. I believe in baptism by immersion. Got to be saved first, obviously. And you'll find out that guy suffered greatly for the cause of Jesus Christ because of his stand on the Bible. An American. A Baptist American. Folks, uh, if you study a little Baptist history, it'll make you realize what little backbone you got living in the current world we live in. I read that and I, I just feel so low. And I think, man, I need to be like those guys. You know why those guys were great? They believed the book. They trusted God. And they got busy. They didn't sit around. You know what they could have done? They could have said, ah, well, we'll do our thing in secret. This Obadiah Holmes was a, was a fellow who would go out there and give it to him in public, Brandon. Amen. And uh, uh, Shubal Stearns was another guy. Shubal Stearns, great preacher, way back, several hundred years ago. You ought to read about that guy. Uh, wasn't afraid to go out in public and preach and, and get the truth out there. So real quick here, wrapping up here. Joshua tells his own people they can have more land if they're willing to work and fight for it. So he was basically saying, stop sitting around, get in the fight, and the Lord will reward you. So this morning, how about we all get in the fight because there's great reward. Stop complaining. Stop making excuses. Stop being fearful. Drop this disgusting attitude of entitlement and get something done for the Lord Jesus Christ while we got the freedom and the ability to do so. These two tribes this morning that we studied, the tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh, were a whole lot like a lot of Christians today. They were saved, but not satisfied. How you doing? You saved? Are you also satisfied with what God's given you and willing to go and get something done for God because of what he's given you? Let's pray together this morning. Lord, we just thank you for your words, how, how so applicable they are to us in the modern day we live in. Lord, I pray that none of us here this morning, none of, us, uh, none of the folks hearing from home right now, would be like these sons of Joseph. May we not have this attitude of being entitled and make excuses, but may we be a, an active people in this week ahead, uh, doing something for you. And I just pray for our time of invitation that folks here respond uh, the way that you desire, the way that you have laid on every individual heart. May we not worry about what other people think this morning, but truly just want to please you. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.